Hey everybody, how is it going? What you're about to watch is a video about all things mental health. I sat down with someone called Pav Bryan and he's going to introduce himself in just a second. And we discussed everything that we could think of in the one hour that we'd set ourselves aside. Now, in that time, you can't possibly cover everything to do with mental health. It's far too big a topic. It's one that I've spent recent years trying to learn a little bit more about and one that I'd like to continue learning about in years to come as well. A lot of what we discuss is from personal experience and we mentioned that in the video as well. But what we'd really like to know is what your thoughts on the video are. Do you have any comments? Do you have any questions? Because we'd love to meet up again and discuss things in further detail. It says it's recording. <laughs> I can only hope it actually is. So I'll start off by saying, hi, Pav. Could you um, introduce yourself? to everyone. Hey Chris. Um, yeah, so I'm Pav, I, Pav Bryan. I'm the uh, performance director at uh, Spokes and uh, uh, Spokes is a, a, new, a new business or relatively new business that uh, coaches endurance athletes around the world. Uh, we have uh, about 20 coaches now and um, specialise in all, all endurance sports really but mainly cycling and triathlon and uh, have a, a team of experts that support the coaches and uh, from strength and conditioning, sleep, recovery, uh, and so obviously mental fitness, um, which is something I'm passionate about. As an athlete, I was all right in time trials. I, I, <laughs> I, I won some sort of regional stuff, um, long distance stuff back when I used to live in the UK uh, before, when, before I moved to the US where I am now, which was um, four years I've been here now, which is, uh, is crazy. And like I said, I, one of the things that I'm passionate about most is, uh, uh, is, is mental health. And that's through my own journey and through being uh, uh, diagnosed as, as being bipolar, um, oh, Christ, a bit over 10 years ago now, and spending a, a short period uh, as a voluntary inpatient at a hospital and being on medication and, and really sort of rehabilitating myself and my life and, and coming through that journey, which has ultimately led me to, to be quite a, uh, a, strong, uh, a strong, strong individual, even if I do still have the same, the same struggles. And um, yeah, I mean, for me, um, cycling, I know it's a cliche now, a lot of people say it, but cycling definitely did save my life. And I can, I, I can say it's not, it's not perfect. Like there's days where I, like because I work in the industry, um, cycling is the last thing I want to do, and that's kind of why I'm 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 more into running as well now. Um, but um, uh, exercise is is one of like four things that I I really rate highly in terms of uh, uh, of my of a sort of mental health wellness, and, and the others being nutrition um, and then relaxation or some form of like you know meditation or you know just taking time for yourself and then support. And I think the support is. It's probably one of the reasons why we're here today, Chris, because we want to obviously talk about like uh, how difficult it can be to to actually be honest about how we're feeling. It is that first step that is actually the hardest one to take, isn't it? It's you can spend a long time suspecting that something is not quite right, but for me personally, I spent a long time doing things that I perceived to be a cry for help because I wasn't strong enough to actually ask for the help. But, you know, no matter how you behave, actually, these cries for help, no one's going to come and help you. You have to, but certainly, no matter how much I was pushed by friends and family, it, it's still yourself, ultimately, that has to, has to reach out and say, look, I, I need help here. I, I don't know if that was the same for you. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, absolutely, growing up, I mean, I... Um... I could. Tell, I, don't, I don't really want to <laughs> share too many stories. I've, yeah, I've done stuff which I can. I can say was a cry for help, and that's what led me to kind of. Um, I mean, I always sort of say rock bottom sometimes is the best place to be because once you hit rock bottom, the only place is up. And as long as you're sort of there and you really acknowledge and and, and actually are like, yeah, this is this, this is where I need help. Yeah. Um, that's probably the the best the turning point in most people's lives, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Like that, that whole thing, I, I, someone sent me a, um, a little uh, meme or it was like a graphic, an infographic on, on mental um, health day the other day, which uh, talked about people with mental health problems and the, the reasons why they kind of are how they are. And, and at the bottom, it was like, one, the thing was like most important of all is that most of these people don't want to be a burden. And I spent 20 minutes, I swear, 20 minutes crying my eyes out to that. <laughs> Because it's so true. It's like it's like it's so easy to get yourself get in your head and think and feel that people are going to be like you're going to be a burden because you're not strong enough. But ultimately, we all have like highs and lows, and uh, 
and I think that the the more we can talk about this, the 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 stronger we can be, not just individually but as a community. I find personally that when you're going through a period of either low mood or just feeling really down or just really struggling to see an end to the situation that you're currently in, understanding that other people have been through that was one of the biggest things that helped me. And actually I actually have a friend that did something similar. He he felt stressed for a long period of time and wanted to understand what true stress was. He spent a long time reading and researching what it would have been like to have been at war in the Second World War. And understanding that other people have these battles and these struggles actually was really quite enlightening because it helped me understand that, you know what, it's okay not to be all right. It's okay not to have everything figured out in the way that I thought I did. So probably one of the first things I'd recommend anyone did was just to reach, you know, not just re- not reach out, but start investigating and doing a little research about how it actually feels when you're feeling like that. Because once you start to get an understanding of what feelings are, then you can start to not necessarily control them, but at least you understand what's going on inside of your own head. And that's something that I wish I'd known before because it took a long time to get to that point. Um, I would say it took about three and a half years to be really honest. And yeah, I mean, it's, I think we're all on the journey, aren't we? And it's, um, I, I think that it is, I, I mean, when, when I first shared my, when I, I always say when I came out of the bipolar closet, when I, <laughs> I mean, it, there was a, a, a long time where I was, when I was younger and I was, I was diagnosed that I did share that a lot. And then um, I think that given that it was 10 years ago and it was, um, and I was in a bad place anyway, but there was a lot of stigma around um, being mentally unwell back then. I, 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 I learned to not share that. Um, and it was, it was funnily enough, it was, it was through cycling that someone convinced me to, to share that story. I have a best friend and he, he saw me, um, when I was growing up and I was an absolute mess. And then he saw me winning like, um, like, I don't know, 12 hour time trials or like the KCA best all rounder. And, and he, he, he came and visited me when I first moved to the States and we were, we were just like walking around and he was like, man, you've got to share your story. Like you're so quiet about your mental health, but people would be inspired. And after a while I was like, okay, like, sure, I can share that. Um, and that's where we kind of came up with some of the silly, like route 66, like charity rides that we did. Cause we, that's where we were at the end of route 66. But my, my initial, my initial thing was that if I could just help like one person, if I could inspire one person to maybe share their story, or encourage them to to look at their own self about like uh, their like be mindful about their feelings. Then it would be worthwhile. Yeah. You touched on your time trialing and things like that. Can you elaborate on how your mental health or athletes' mental health has gone on to affect their physical performance? Yeah. So. Um, I, I can speak from a personal point of view, um, but I think actually collectively with all my athletes, and I've worked with hundreds of athletes over almost a decade of being a cycling coach, a bit less than a decade, um, maybe even thousands, I don't know. But um, I, the, the ones that have a, um, a fluctuating mental health where they're, they're not stable and they're you know not quote unquote happy uh, a happy person where they might be susceptible to you know seasonal affective disorder or like just depression clinical depression or something like that um i i don't know if i can name any athlete or think of one athlete who i i has suffered with depression who becomes a stronger athlete when they're depressed i don't know i don't know anyone and maybe there are people out there and f- fair play but i mean i i it's uh it it's uh, there's an obvious um when you're feeling like that low about yourself like even trying to get on the bike some days can be really challenging like when you're that depressed i mean sometimes if you're in a real deep depression i mean like you're not thinking about riding a bike you're thinking about like is my is my life worth living yeah like is is that is that actually like what i what i want to be doing is living but uh and i think that's I, it's really funny like a lot of my clients now like after i've built a relationship with them they tell me that it's like they're like paying for a really cheap therapist with me because they know that they can come to me and uh, and talk about their mental health and it's like i'm not ever going to force my clients to ride a bike or give them a hard time because then they're, they're not when they're, they're not training 
Um, but I am going to sit with them and get on the phone with them and be like, hey, look, let's talk about your problems and let's just see what we can do in terms of an action plan to help you. And, and that might be like, you know, go for an hour ride, no training at all. Just go out, like go out, but don't, don't take your Garmin or Wahoo or whatever. Just go out and like ride for fun. Like, you know, uh, like join a Zwift race and do a Zwift race or something like that. And, 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 and I mean, for me, that's the, 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 the biggest thing. And um, in, in terms of depression is how hard it can be. And, uh, from, from my own point of view, I, uh, being bipolar, I can tell you that I can race pretty good if I can get myself in a manic state. <laughs> it's not always advisable <laughs> for obvious reasons, but um, having that kind of high elation, um, almost like sense of godlikeness um, can do wonders for kind of pushing through mental barriers, which are almost non-existent when you're in that kind of, uh, in that flow. But uh, there, yeah, there, there's obvious problems around kind of, you know, like trying to force a, a, a manic, manic state in someone with bipolar in that it's, um, it's not always easy to come back from it. <laughs> no, I imagine every, every trough after that peak is going to be. Yeah, exactly. And it can be difficult. Like our, the highs are accompanied by lows. Yeah. It's very rarely that you kind of, um, if you force or you go into a manic state that you kind of come out of that stable, you don't, you do tend to hit quite a deep depression. Yeah. Do you notice that either your athletes or yourself personally, that there are telltale signs when there are either these peak performances coming or these great troughs that are going to hit you as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like I'm, I'm, I have uh, a great belief in my coaching that is it's truly like the contact with me is unlimited. And I work with a small group of clients because I, I want them to, or I want to be able to support them in, in anything so if like i wake up and i've got a text from from the clients it's like the first thing i do if i i, I tend to spend a lot more time communicating via voice voice memos so i'll send like a voice whatsapp or a vox or something like that and and backwards and forwards and i build that relationship primarily so that when i stop to see that communication or that communication changes i'm able i'm able to identify that as a warning sign and i i think um I, I think if everybody on this like knew someone who is who has suffers with depression will know just how like um recluse someone becomes or withdrawn people become more withdrawn and they're a lot more quiet and you might know someone who always has talks or always checks in with you and then maybe they've not done for a week and and that's that's a, a warning sign but from from an athlete point of view yeah it's like is, is the session being completed like as planned? Are the notes in like training peaks or, or whatever, are they being completed? If, if they're not, then it's a good sign that, that something's wrong there. And, uh, uh, and that's what I build with my clients. I just build that relationship where they're, they're totally free and open to talk to me about whatever they, uh, whatever they want. And sometimes we have some, we have some really funny conversations. So, I mean, obviously not going to share any, but um, <laughs> some very personal stuff. <laughs> But that's, that's it, isn't it? Like an athlete is a complete package. You're not, you're not a machine. You're not just a set, set of legs. Your, your mind is powering those legs no matter who you are. And, you know, from personal experience, if you're not you, if you're not 100% you, you're never going to get 100% of you out onto the road or onto the mountain bike or onto the track, whichever discipline or sport even that you choose. It's, it's really weird. You know, like 15 years ago, I never heard of anyone talk about mental health i never thought it would be something that i would ever struggle with and actually it was a few events before the end of my career that triggered it all and to the point that i thought that i didn't want to race my bike anymore i thought you know this is what's causing those issues but it was actually something which was linked i've, I've actually been on a video not too long ago saying it was when the team halved our salaries funnily enough you could take away half of the incentive for doing a job you're probably going to be about 50% motivated, aren't you? <laughs> and it, was like, it triggered, you know, a huge set of issues. And then I retired from racing. And that's when I really realized that there was a big problem because like you said, I started about alcohol. I started drinking a lot. And I thought that that would replace the sort of emotions and the feelings I was getting from racing and from training. And it turned out that that was a very, very temporary fix because that just doesn't work. It's, it, it maybe works for the, the few hours a day that you can possibly spend drinking. And as soon as that's <laughs> gone, then the cortisol levels in your body are high. Your heart will be pounding away and you'll be feeling stressed. And actually the only thing that I found that fixed it for me personally was exercise. And then slowly I fell back in love 
with racing and that's or with training and then with racing and that's how I then met you and Stefan from Spokes as well who now supplies my coaching and that's how I ended up returning to competition is in pursuit of the person that I thought was the true version of me to make me feel complete was Chris Opie the cyclist and without that I didn't know who I was anymore although to be really really honest this year has kind of given me this period of time to think about who that is Have you noticed other athletes that you coach differences in their mentality this year compared to other years? And how is, how has this whole pandemic affected them? Majority of my clients, their mentality didn't change a lot. There was a lot of frustration, um, a heck of a lot because a lot of my clients that we'd all trained through winter, uh, doing an incredibly great job. Like, I mean, some of these guys have been with me three or four years, still hitting like power PBs. I mean, they're in their forties and fifties, some of these guys as well. So like, they're totally smashing it. They're going to do like, you know, the attack or um, uh, like maritona stuff like that. And, and then all of a sudden there's no events for it. So uh, yeah, the first thing you get is like a message, which is like a few swear words and a bit of frustration. <laughs> but I mean, good part of being a coach is that you get to have a, uh, have a, like a realistic, like re- resetting of goals. And a, a lot of my clients were just like, Hey, look, let's just enjoy this time. I could still train, um, maybe do some like, uh, on, online group rides and stuff like that. And I mean, some of these guys have like, as I said, been the power, the power PBs they've been getting from basically an extended winter training period is, <laughs> it's been incredible. And then the ones that really suffer, or I say suffer is the wrong word, but some that struggle with indoor training, um, we've just like created self-supported events outside, you know, like I have one guy who was going to, um, do, a, a single as the Von two. Uh, I think two weeks ago, a week ago, and that got canned because uh, of like uh, an increase in, uh, uh, I think uh, he couldn't travel. I think he lives in Germany and was obviously having to travel to the France. I think that couldn't happen. But for whatever reason, it couldn't happen. It was a COVID related reason. So we just got him to do like uh, a base camp Everest. You yeah. know, it's like he, he, he climbed, a more, they climbed more elevation than he would have done at Von Tu. Um, but he, he did that and he loved it. It's like, it's, it's crazy. I mean, we, we, can, all, we can all like uh, adjust our, our kind of like goals and expectations. I think that, and, and that's what like a, a good coach will do for you as well. Like keep you, keep you motivated and keep you interested. So yeah, of course there's frustration, um, but uh, there's a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity. Yeah. And you also led with your own mad challenge this year as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So in um, February, I, um, I, I rode up and down um, the same hill, a uh, mile and a half pill, I think it is roughly, um, 220 times or something to uh, uh, climb the equivalent elevation at the highest peak on every continent. So Everest was day one and uh, Aconcagua and then like Denali, Vincent Massive, uh, Kilimanjaro, Ibrus, and I, there might be one more I'm forgetting there. But <laughs> basically I did six days, seven hours of going up and down the same hill um, and it's not, it's not like a, it, it's got some steep ramps, like some yeah. seriously steep ramps. And, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was just something that was, it was ridiculous. Everybody like, I mean, I, I love it. Everybody's doing Everest and stuff at the moment because it's like something that you can test yourself on. It's really fun. It's like, it's, it's kind of mentally as difficult. Oh. It was a great event. Like I, I mean, I don't know anyone who's been stupid enough to do that, but it was like 140,000 feet in, uh, in that time. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was. Um, uh, I was really happy to have uh, to tick that one off. That is it's incredible. In my mind, I would not have the mental strength to get through a week up and down the same road like that. I mean, we talk about mental health and things like that. How does mental strength differ from mental health in your mind? That's a tricky one. I think that. One of the things that my, um, my doctors, my psychiatrists, my psychologists have always told me, and this is probably true of a lot of, um, a lot of people who are bipolar or other mental, severe like mental disabilities, because that's what it actually is, yeah. um, are who, who are very successful. And that's because we've, we've, either, we've figured out as best as possible to, to deal with our daily challenges. And um, my point was, is that one of the things that my doctors used to say about me was that for all of the problems and challenges that I have, I have an incredibly focused drive 
to do things. And once I get an idea in my head, I find it really hard to let go again. There's obvious problems with that. But, um, but the, the, the thing was, is that I, I have that goal. I have that goal. And yet, like I, I, quite a lot of those days, I was like, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. But I, I can keep in my mind, and that, I think that's that mental strength you're talking about, that I will finish it. And like barring some sort of, I don't know, third party influence, like getting hit by a, a car or going down or having an injury of some sort, um, that was never going to stop me. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. And like, I know I've interviewed loads of people like, you know, Dean Stott, who did like Pan American Highway Challenge. And he's like, and, and loads of people who have been like, it, who have been in the forces, and they never say that they've, they experienced that doubt. Um, but then I spoke to people like, I think Mark Beaumont and like, uh, I think Sean Conway. And I think they're more like the, yeah, okay, we do think about that, but we also have that drive to, to succeed. And, and I think that there, there's just got to be that, for, for me, when it gets to that point, it's about, I try to visualize how I'm going to feel at the end when I'm done. And that really motivates me without thinking about how much I've got to do if that makes sense. So yes, I had to do like, I think it was 30 odd, um, a sense of this, of this climb in day one, but I wasn't thinking that I was doing it in like four or five a sense and then taking a quick break. So it was never, it was never kind of like, Oh man, I've got 28 to go. It's like, I've got two to go. And I think that that's what happens. Like I've been reading Mark by Mont's book again, and he's always like, he breaks it down into like little chunks. And I think that people who are, have got that, that athletic goal, or I mean, even, even maybe non-athletic goal, when you start to break things down into smaller, more manageable pieces, that's where it becomes really achievable. I think looking at something that is massive becomes really overwhelming. Um, and I think that that's mental strength. And, um, and I think that, uh, yeah, it does differ to, to, to mental health. What should you do if you have a friend, a teammate, someone you know, someone you work with that you can clearly see is struggling with something? What is the best way? What is the best way to broach that? Basically, I mean that's really tricky because a lot of people are uh, that you you can't force someone to talk, you can't force them to be open, you can't force them to do anything. So, um, I, I think that the best way to approach that is. Um, I mean, you, you should know if you're the right person. Like if it's just a friend, like an acquaintance or something, I mean, you might not be the best person to kind of um, to talk to, to them. I mean, there has to be that trust. And I think that ultimately um, for, for me, it's about um, what I like to hear from people is when they come and they just say, hey, look, I, you look like you're having a bit of a hard time or something like just I'm here if you want to talk. Um, and uh uh, and I think that that is, is, is really crucial is that not forcing someone to talk, but being supportive and being there and being able to um, be there for that person. Have you ever in your experience come across anyone whose mental health didn't benefit from doing exercise? No, absolutely not. No, no. I mean, hundred percent what doctors should be doing. I mean, like I, I was just to go to go back to my story a little bit when I when I started getting the help that I, I really needed at the time the doctors put me on on some quite quite a very high dose of um, uh, uh, mood stabilizing drugs and and the side effects of those can be worse than the the like the, the symptoms of, of being bipolar and it's it's a fact that more people commit suicide on the medication than off of it um, and I'm not, I'm definitely not a doctor and I'm not suggesting that anybody listening to this on medication just gives up their meds. But I think that there is definitely a role that doctors should be playing in terms of, you know, mental health isn't just about prescribing a medication. If you go out and you exercise and, and train, training and exercise are obviously two different things. Exercise is something where you're, you're not necessarily creating a great deal of strain training can create a lot of problems with mental health if you get too tired like it can and i you, you're probably the same as i chris that especially when you're doing an awful lot of a lot of training it can be very difficult so we say about exercising and then like i said earlier that nutrition if you if you're eating mcdonald's all the time and all that junk like even normal people without mental health challenges you're going to notice like that a high sugar high processed fat diet you're going to have those peaks and troughs, lots of alcohol, lots of caffeine. 
those it's great when you're high and it's crap when you're low and that that instability causes an awful lot of problems and then like i said finding some way to relax and for some people that's cycling some people meditation sauna swimming you know time to be with yourself and then that support those those four things when you really get those and they're working well all together then I don't, I don't think that everybody who's on medication will need to be on medication. And, and, and I think that that's something that I've learned. And yeah, fundamentally, cycling, uh, it can be a huge part of that. Exercise is, is probably, probably the, the biggest chunk of that. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right about the difference between training and exercise. So when I stopped training as, a, as an athlete and I started exercising, the exercise did me the world of good. You know, 30 minutes to 90 minutes a day, I felt amazing. I, you know, I genuinely felt really good for it. Set loads of PBs because I was fresh. I still had the fitness from being a pro athlete. But then there were times when I was training and you have to remind yourself as an athlete that, no, I'm actually not depressed. I'm just exhausted. Like it's, yeah. it's okay to be tired and it's okay to feel down because you're tired. That's, that's a whole other thing. And it's a bit of a tightrope, that one, isn't it? Because you can easily confuse a bit of tiredness for something much bigger, but equally if that lingers for a, a long period of time, it can become a problem of its own, can't it? Well, I mean, I can tell you training for Route 66, which I did in 2018, I, I mean, and when you're, when you're talking about doing like 260 miles a day for 10 days, um, I mean, like that, the, the training for that is, it, you have to, you have to be tired because I mean, fundamentally, you need to, you need to experience that getting up in the morning and riding a bike and you need to experience the lows that come with being absolutely really, really tired and having to ride. And, uh, and the training reflects that. But ultimately, like I can tell you, I was done with that event before it even started. I had, I had had enough of it. And, and I mean, that partly was because I was chasing sponsorship and organizing the event as well, but riding like riding, like I had done around like a, a family and every other responsibility that I have, yeah, definitely pushed me into depression. Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. And the best thing for me was uh, to come out of that and take that that little break. So, yeah, I completely, completely get your point, Chris. If you had one ultimate tip or a few small tips that you would bundle together for anyone that isn't necessarily feeling one hundred percent themselves, what would it be? Well, I mean, definitely, definitely don't ever stop like exercising. Try and try and do that at least like 30 minutes a day. Um, it'll make you make you feel so good. Like nutrition, definitely eat as healthy as possible. You don't have to be a monk. And like, I think you like, enjoy the odd beer or the odd fast food. But I think maybe like just keep like a log of how you feel after you eat those foods. Because for me, like, I mean, I'm an alcoholic, but I hate drinking. Like I, I have that drive to, to drink and I'll, I'll drink every now and again. And then I, I, like, I like feel sick sometimes after drinking or I wake up the next morning and I hate it. And I just kind of have that mindfulness now where I'm like, I hate that. I hate that feeling so much um, that actually when I start to have that want to drink alcohol, I'm like the, the, the willpower, which is I would rather feel healthier, I'd rather feel happier and healthier is much stronger. And uh, yeah, I'm not perfect. Of course, I'm an alcoholic, but <laughs> but I mean that's 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 one thing for me. So I, I would I would be like probably the top tip there is maybe just to keep like a log of how you're feeling and the things that affect it. Like, do you feel good after you do like a 30 minute ride? I mean, I'm hoping yes. Do you feel good after you eat like a, a you know like a salad and stuff like that? I'm hoping yes. And then the opposite is true. Um, and then of, co of course go and find go and find someone doesn't have to be like your wife or your husband doesn't have to be like parents doesn't have to be you don't have to pay for a therapist i mean it could just be like a random friend or you know like a acquaintance or even a coach yeah, <laughs> but yeah. find them to talk to find them to talk to because they're, they're like find someone and you'll you'll, you'll soon trust them and uh, and they'll come from a place of non-judgment and uh, and and there's advice if you want it but there's no advice if you don't want it so i think that like there, there, there's, there's a few tips there, but yeah, I think that they're, they're really crucial. Uh, so for anyone watching, wanting to find out more information about you or about spokes fit, where would you recommend they go? Absolutely. So yeah, you can go to the, the website. It's a great start. Um, www.spokes.fit or follow me on social media and at Pav Brian on all of them, all of the, the big three anyway. Um, and, or yeah, if you're interested in, in, in a bigger look at um, the, the mentality side of uh, cycling and training uh, in mental health, uh, uh, my, my book, which was uh, Amazon number one new release uh, in 
nearly a year ago now, uh, the guide to truly effective cycling um, is probably, unless there's something that's come out recently, the the, the book that really looks uh, the most at mentality as a, a key factor in training. Um, so yeah, social media, website, book. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And Pavs, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. Is it okay if anyone has any questions, they can drop it down in the comments and maybe we can meet up again? Oh, absolutely. I'd love that. Yeah. Brilliant. Me too. Thank you very much, Pavs. Thanks, Chris. Like I said at the start, I would love to know your thoughts. It's an interesting topic. It's one that you can't possibly cover in just half an hour. If you're interested in this sort of video, I would love to speak to more people to get more people's perspective on something that's becoming more and more relevant in these modern times that we live in. That's it from me. I will see you all again soon.